All right, so this is, this is lecture 16 of ECE 2305. And so in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the all-important technology called 802.11 and all its variants. Okay? So, so it, it's going to be a little bit difficult because there's a lot of like sort of dry standards and definitions, but I'll do my best to, I, I think this lecture, and what better way on a Friday afternoon, it's going to be one part technology, but it will also be one part history lesson. Oh, okay. No, no, but seriously, I think it's actually enjoyable because let's, well, it depends on if you like history at all and if what type of history and such. Personally, I like anything to do with, uh, um, you know, if you're outside of the United States, the American Civil War, but I guess you call it the Civil War in the United States, right? So, um, and other, it's World War I and all that sort of history, also ancient Greek history. But this is a different type of history. This ties into your ECE 2799. This ties into any sort of course that involves some sort of design and entrepreneurship. What, this, th what we're going to see here is what happens when you have technology mixed in with commerce and a market. So what happened is, to give a little bit of perspective, so first of all, why did, how come wireless LAN came out the way that it did? Why did some of the sort of key technologies at the right time and the right place, actually took over the market and, and while others kind of floundered. So let's, let's put things in perspective. So as you're going to see later on, I'm going to talk about a key technology called OFDM. And we saw this before, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, right? It's used in almost everything now, right? What happens is OFDM was around since the 1970s, the early 1980s, but it never picked up until the early 2000s, right? And there was a reason for that. So um, maybe I'm going to embarrass myself, um, which is not that difficult. How many people here were, uh, actually, let me think. I, actually, none of you should have been born after 2000, okay? So everyone here was born after 1990? 1990, almost? Before, before. okay. So, woo! Like, so, so what happens is, um, in the 1990s, it was insane. Like, you know, if you were in wireless communications, that was the profession to be in. Like, you know, you would get scooped up and hired by the Nortels and the Cisco's and the Alcatel's and the Lucent's and the Bell Labs. It was great being a wireless communications engineer. Everything else is like, what, you're in controls? Or power or any of those? They didn't even compare to wireless comms. And the main driving force was cellular technology, right? So what ended up happening was you had the 2.5G, which we talked about, and that was a great success. Everybody wanted to get a cell phone, but it was the size of a brick, and people wanted to do more. And then there was this talk of 3G, you know, so, um, and people are saying, what can you do with 3G? I can download data and it will be secure and I can have a lot of capacity. Everyone can have a cell phone. And so the engineers got onto it and then they began hiring more and more. And then also at the same time, they could, the other area other than wireless communications that was skyrocketing was photonics. And you might say, what's photonics? Optical communications. And what folks were doing was they were trying to bury as much fiber into the ground. They wanted the entire planet covered in fiber optics, right? And then, unfortunately, in 2001, just like the housing bubble a few years ago and all these other bubbles, poof, the telecommunication bubble hit, right? And what ended up happening was there, there were like a number of factors, but there was a lot of money thrown into this area and, and yet development was kind of slow. Like 3G technology began experiencing some issues. Um, uh, people then realized the society was not using up as much bandwidth with that fiber as they could have possibly anticipated. Like after the bubble bursted, you had tons of unused fiber in the ground. It was kind of like, okay, why did I do all of it? Just like, you know, if we look at the reference with the housing bubble. Like for instance, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Ireland recently. Um, they had a housing bubble there. And I think there was one point, if my statistics don't, are not incorrect, um, I think a few years ago they had something like 200,000 empty homes. They just built like mad. And Ireland's a very small country, and most of their growth was tied to construction. And they had all these houses, but no one to buy them. And they were all in the middle of nowhere, far away from Dublin or Cork or Limerick. So it was like, 
Why do we have this? And the same thing with telecom. Tons of fiber, very slow development with respect to cellular technology, and, and, and there was lots of promises made, but they were not realized, right? And so you had startups that began falling off the face of the earth. You had the big giants unable to adapt suffering. Unfortunately, Nortel fell off the map. Motorola was now a shell of its former self. It shed its cellular branch. It's now, I believe, Google. Google uh, acquired it. And, and Nokia just recently, yes. Ah. <laughs> I didn't hear about that last one. Oh, so, so there you go. What happens is, is like, do you want my cellular company? Yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, do I have to pay that much? No, 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 I want to get rid of it, you know, sort of thing. So exactly, like, you know, and that's the thing. Or like recently, Nokia. Like, here you go, Microsoft. I don't really, uh, you know, yes. Google is buying up a lot of the uh, black fiber, though, as well. That's I'm true. It, well, well, the thing is, like, you know, Google buying black fiber, of, uh, it's, their strategy is they're going to try and bypass the middleman, right? It's like, service providers? No way! We're just going to go straight to the masses, you know? So Google will be, uh, what is it? Google will be father, Google will be mother. Yeah, it basically, you know, and so they're going to, like, bypass the AT&Ts, the Verizons, and all those guys to do that, right? So, and exactly, what happens is, um, the, the, these giants of uh, companies, Cisco still stayed in business remarkably, Lucent got bought out by a French company, Alcatel, and so you had this like huge dynamic. People didn't realize that these big companies, the worst to me, the, and like, you know, as a telecommunications engineer, um, the one that hurt me the most was Bell Labs. So Bell Labs was like huge innovator, like, you know, the information uh, revolution that we had over the 60, 70 years. In fact, you weren't somebody in telecommunications unless you did a stint at Bell Labs. So you ask maybe some of the older professors in the department, ask uh, Professor Orr or any of the older professors in the department, and they've all been to Bell Labs for a few years. So that was like a rite of uh, passage uh, to saying, yes, I'm, part of, I'm buying into the telecommunications revolution. I was at Bell Labs. And to see that place disappear was kind of sad. But what happened is during that uh, vacuum, this took off. What happened is you had in 2000, at the same time, folks were talking about, well, d d I just want like, you know, local, uh, convenient, cheap wireless access. Um, and I want it with my laptop uh, so I can send emails. Like I don't want to be tethered by, by a wireline. And so uh, wireless LANs came into being, like in, in a big way. You had wireless local area networks before, but it began really taking off and also became kind of heated. So, um, you know, there's some frequencies. Uh, the most common frequencies that wireless LANs use mostly are 2.4 or 2.5. We still do that today, right? Your laptops, turtle bots, almost everything uses 2.4 or 2.5, and we got the 5 to 5.9, right? However, okay, so, so maybe to give a bit of insight. So first of all, topologies, like, so, uh, like Wi-Fi, specifically 802.11, has the star topology, which we talked about yesterday. So you have your router, your switch, your wireless router, your wireless switch, and everyone connects to it. Like, you know, so I can talk to it, you can talk to that wireless access point. Everyone here, if you open up your laptop, and some of you have, um, can talk to that uh, Wi-Fi access point over there. It's a star. Or you can be in ad hoc mode. You can talk to you, can talk to, everyone can talk to each other and make what we call a mesh, right? Infrastructureless mode, right? Now, before we go any further into this 802.11, there was another, you know, almost sounds like something from Star Wars, like, Luke, there is another Skywalker. I don't know how this microphone is going to pick it up. And for those students not here that are listening afterwards, <laughs> they'll say, who, do, like, you know, it's like, this is Alex's twin brother. No, 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 just kidding. I'm just adding some audio there. <laughs> Sorry. But there was another contender before basically 802.11 became like, you know, the only game in town. Well, sort of, okay? And that name, that other game, was Hyperland. <gasps> just the name just stirs up these, like, you know, thoughts of, like, Hyperland. You see this, like, star pattern race in front of you, and your land just goes through space. No, no, no. So that is the European contender 
to IEEE 802.11. So maybe as a side note, um, there is a little bit of international politics with respect to wireless standards. So IEEE, even though they say the international, um, um, you know, the in, uh, sorry, it's like Institute of Electrical and Electronics uh, Engineers, right? And it's supposed to be international, blah, 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 blah. Where is its headquarters? Piscataway, right? Like, like you know, any of you that go to New Jersey, you like, you got to go to IEEE headquarters and bow before it. It's like, you know, it's electrical engineering, you know, it's like, you know, the temple of, no, no, just kidding, it's not. It's just an office building, but a big one. But what happens is a lot of people think it's US-centric. Most of the members are in the US. A lot of the executives are in the US. Um, everything kind of revolves around the US. If you have a lawsuit against IEEE, you'll take them to US court, right? So things like that. The contender is Etsy, right? So it's the European version of the IEEE. They also make standards, right? But what happens is it's kind of interesting. Etsy formed this Hyperland and Hyperland 2. And it was a beautiful standard. In fact, it, did, it performed better in terms of data rate and in terms of, um, you know, sort of like the, it avoided some of the pitfalls that we have today with um, 802.11. Like, for instance, it transmitted at 5 gigahertz rather than 2.4, which is very congested now. It transmitted a much higher data rate than 802.11. What were the problems? Of this, so any of you that I'm not, I'm not asking. I'm just like sort of saying, any of you who are interested in making your own company, right? Who are interested in entrepreneurship, or you have a great idea and stuff. There's this, there are a couple of key principles, right? There are two in particular. One, you better be first to market, right? If you have a competitor with a similar product, you better be first, all right? Uh, especially in the case of Hyperland, they were a few years behind. And by that time, 802.11 was already getting entrenched. The other thing, cost and complexity. 802.11 may not have the same performance as Hyperland, but it did way better. Uh, I mean, sorry, it did not have the uh, cost and complexity. Uh, sorry, blah, 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 let me take that back. So 802.11, in terms of performance, did not do as well as Hyperland, but it was cheaper and was less complex. So in the end, like, would you pay $500 for a wireless NIC for your laptop or $100? Um, I don't know. I, I like giving my money to this company selling me more expensive. Like, you know, unless you're a purist uh, and you love having everything gold-plated and such, you would go for the cheaper option, right? So what happens is Hyperland, despite all the work that's been done, it lost out to 802.11. Then, the original 802.11, I'm just going to cut to the chase. So like, this is just a small laundry list. There's actually three, four other standards out there. So let, let me actually write those down. And I'll do the best I can to explain what they are. So there was the original 802.11. It had uh, capabilities of 1 megabit per second to 2 megabits per second. Kind of slow, right? Imagine, like you're trying to download a movie, right? Do, 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 do. It's like every five seconds it pauses like this. I'm like very annoying, right? You know, yeah, <laughs> sorry, really bad. So then a few years later came 802.11b. It's actually kind of messed up. You'll see in a second. 802.11b can go up to 11 megabits per second. It, and both of these guys just to add, are 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. Okay, It operates in that frequency band. That frequency band, just as a heads up, so as an aside, aside this guy is an ISM band. ISM, again, means industrial, scientific, that might be us, and medical. Pre, uh, uh, medical, medical band. So this is an unlicensed band. Uh, part of the reason why uh, it's unlicensed is because, again, it has interference with microwave ovens. So no company in the right mind would want to operate with microwave ovens around because it would interfere. So they made it free. Here you go. So 802.11 and 802.11b operates in that band. And then what happens is you got 802.11a. So A before B, or B before A, 
And what was really cool about this guy was it supported data rates up to 54 megabits per second. But this was the big but, is it operated at 5 to 5.9, 5.8, 5 5.9 gigahertz. This is actually a big problem, right? This was actually the turn off for Hyperland, and unfortunately, 802.11a didn't do much better. And the reason for that is here, this is actually two sets of bands. So here's another aside. The lower portion of it, the first like um, 0.7 gigahertz of it, is UNII, which means unlicensed, this is in the US, unlicensed national information infrastructure band. Infrastructure band. Structure. If only I could know how to spell. And so that's an unlicensed band. And then the hot upper portion of it, there is some ISM is there as well. Actually, it should be 5.8. So this is great. Like you have this swath of frequency, and nobody really transmits there. Problem is, there's a reason why nobody transmits there. It's quite high in frequency, so the propagation characteristics are not as attractive. You essentially get, like, you know, if you put them side by side, you get half the range, transmission range. So if you have a 5 gigahertz access point and you have a 2.4 gigahertz access point, the 2.4 is going to propagate approximately twice as far within a building than compared to 5. Do you think that's great? Imagine if you had a building like this and it's only 5 gigahertz access points, you would have to put twice the number of access points throughout the building because you wouldn't have the same coverage, right? So then came along the following, 802.11g. It did up to 54 megabits per second. And it also did 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, OK, one thing, all of these guys are backwards compatible. So if you, if you had um, an access point or a card that said, oh, this is 802.11g, it also means it's backwards compatible with 11a, 11b, and 11. All right? But and what, what supported, what got you these 11 megabits per second in both these cases? Um, OFDM technology. OFDM became kind of prevalent during this time and supported these high data rates. Then what we got is 802.11n. And what was really cool is that this thing like doubled, more than doubled uh, the data rates of like 802.11g and a. And, what's, and that also operated in 2.4, sorry, 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. And what was the key technology here? So in 11A and 11G, it was OFDM. I cannot emphasize that enough. In 11N, there was another thing called MIMO. MIMO depends on who you ask, right? Multiple in, multiple out. So what does MIMO technology do? Multiple antennas. So what it means, multiple input, multiple output, and I'll draw this in a few minutes because I don't want to ruin this nice, nice list. What, what it does is the more antennas you have, you can do some very crafty things where you can put some of the signals out of phase. You can send a lot more data on each antenna, and it's picked up by a lot more antennas at the receiver. You can multiply the amount of information that's transmitted, right? And that requires some very fancy signal processing. So who does MIMO in WPI? Professor Brown. So Professor Brown does this thing called distributed MIMO, where you don't even have the antennas connected to the same radio, but you have them on one antenna on a different radio all over the place. And then if you know exactly where their locations are, in phase they can send this ton of, this ton of data to a target. And then that target can convert that information. It will be a lot of information. Very tricky, very tricky, distributed MIMO, but uh, nevertheless, uh, that's sort of the buzzword of today. Everyone's trying to look into that type of MIMO. Again, I'll explain in a few minutes what MIMO is. Now, after N, um, we have 802.11p. Oh, no. 802.11p. This is essentially uh, targeting vehicular applications. It's 
So this is for things like connected vehicles. Okay? So if anyone says connected vehicles, it's most likely there's somewhere in the loop 802.11p. And then we begin going into the double letters. <laughs> so there's 802, yeah, I know, I'm not done yet. 802.11ac, and what ac does is the N version, but for 5 gigahertz. So this is 802.11n, but for 5 gigahertz, right? Because 11n only supports these high data rates, like 108 megabits per second and higher, only at 2.4 gigahertz, but not at 5. 802.11ac does it also for 5, in addition to 2.4 gigahertz. There's also, I know, I'm just keep on going. But see, this is how cool 802 is. 802.11af, this is really nifty, because this is 802.11 applied to TV bands. So let's say you have an unused TV channel. You would use 802.11af to transmit over the unused TV channels to a friend's house, maybe several miles away. So to give you some insights, one of my MQP teams a couple of days ago, so this is another aside. So if you guys are interested in doing long range Wi-Fi, <laughs> there is something, so here's another aside, and my, my students have this. They're using something called the Wi-Fi bullet. So it's a custom solution of Wi-Fi that's highly directional and high power and it could transmit between one to two miles away. So forget about 100 or 200 feet. This thing, so a mile has how many feet? 5,000 something feet? Huh? 5,200. Yeah, see, I grew up with kilometers, so what do I know? So, so 5,280. So imagine double that, so 10,000 feet. You can have Wi-Fi. So where is this used primarily? So suppose you live in Colorado. Anyone here from Colorado? No one from Colorado. So what happens is uh, one of my PhD advisors, his son lives in Colorado in one mountain peak, and then he has a neighbor in the adjoining mountain peak, and, he, and, he, and he's far away from any sort of internet connectivity, but my PhD advisor's son has it. So he says, can you use Wi-Fi, use this bullet thing, he's about a mile and a half away across the valley, can you send me some internet? No problem. And, and that's how they connect, they have a wireless network that just spans the valley and such. All right, so this is designed for TV, we call it TV white space. Okay? And then there is, I know, I just keep on going, 802.11h. And this guy is sub gigahertz, so this is below one gigahertz in frequency. It transmits there, so let's say 900 megahertz, and this is meant for wireless sensor networks. Okay? So, okay, so that's, that's the uh, laundry list of different Wi-Fi, like, you know, of 802.11 standards. So what happens is, from the very beginning to the original 802.11, it just said, we have a good thing, let's make it better, let's apply it to different standards and different applications. So now we have vehicular, we have TV white space, we have sensor networks, we have MIMO technology, we have OFDM, we have at 2.4 gigahertz, we have at 5 gigahertz, we have below 1 gigahertz, we have it in the TV spectrum from 480 megahertz to 700 megahertz. So we have essentially all these variants of 802.11 and it just keeps on going. So, you know, do we have access to these standards? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so is there a naming convention? And the answer is yes. So what happens is, so the IEEE has um, a few standardization committees, as well as a standing or steering committee for this as well. So let's say somebody, so, okay, so here's another, it's, I'll, I'll explain it, and then there's also a political slant to this. There's always politics in all this thing. So as engineers, we're like, <gasps> politics. But no, seriously, you have to understand a little bit about the politics. So what happens is um, all these guys, so the IEEE is the main body that sort of governs this. And so let's say somebody makes a proposal and says, I think we need to strike a new committee that will focus on developing a technology to support 
mm, sensor networks, or let's say Martian communications, or let's say satellite communications, or whatever, right? So to make a case and to say, okay, we therefore create a new committee and it will form this new 802.11 standard, right? Now, what's interesting about these standards? Mostly industry folks on these committees, right? And what do folks in industry want to do? Any, anyone? Yes. <laughs> you read my mind. Yes. That their mission, first and foremost, is to bring profit to their, their company, right? So what happens is these standards committees, what they try and do is like, you know, they're usually industry folks. Academics very seldomly end up on these committees because what do academics care about? I don't know. I don't even know, and I'm an academic. But what, for the most, I, I definitely don't care about making money. So what ends up happening is these guys, they come in, and then what happens is it's like, oh, I think we need this technology. So sometimes it's going to be uh, how efficient, how practical the implementation is. Sometimes, though, it's, oh, I think my company has a really good solution. Oh, and by the way, we just have a patent on this solution, right? So there's going to be this back and forth. And in the end, like, for instance, like there's a modulation scheme called CCK, complementary code keying, that's used in 802.11b and so on. And I believe that was a hybrid solution between several companies. I think it was Harris and maybe one other uh, when it was proposed in this, right? But what happens is often in these committees and these standards, you have several interests involved in trying to shape the direction. Then, once you have these standards, different companies are going to implement it in different ways, right? So what happens in those cases? So let's say you have a Linksys router with a Link, uh, Linksys with a Netgear uh, NIC. How do you know that the two are compatible? So the standards usually specify in the telecommunications world, they specify what the transmitter is, but they don't specify what the receiver should be like, right? So how do you make sure things interoperate? And the answer, you have folks out there. Actually, I'm going to discard, OK? So everyone got that? All right. So yeah, I didn't even give you a chance. Oh, OK. You have folks like IOL. Not AOL. And so this is the interoperability operability lab at UNH, University of New Hampshire. So what they did is they said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we created this facility that companies would come and we would not be biased and we would test out their product against all other products? That's how you would do it. Like for the most part, you can either set up a bunch of specifications, say, if you meet these specs, you can interoperate with other people, or you can do brute force. You can like, take your product and in a very um, you know, sort of methodical and brute force manner, compare, saying, my Linksys router, this candidate router, interoperates with this Linksys uh, device and with this device and that device. Oh, not compatible here. What's going on? How do we fix it? Right? So you can do something brute force in order to get these guys. Because isn't it frustrating if you buy something and then it's not connecting to my Wi-Fi? Wh why is that? And then you find a blog online and someone says, oh, yeah, the firmware needs to be updated to yada, yada, yada to get this connected. Isn't that frustrating? How many of you have had that experience? You buy something and then it doesn't work in like, the, the blog. Yeah. You know, anything. Printers, your laptops. Like, I'm screaming. That has happened so many times. Yep, something like that. Yep. Like, you know, it's like yeah, these kludgy solutions. Or, like, if you have some, some equipment from, like, built before 2000, and you found the drivers for Windows 2000 or something like that. No, Windows 98. And you keep your fingers crossed it works with, like, Windows 7. And it might work or it might not. But nevertheless, you have organizations like these that kind of help to make sure that your product is interoperable. I, so I mentioned MIMO. So let's revisit. Let, let's see what MIMO is. So what is MIMO? So MIMO works like this. So this guy here, this, this is the one symbol for antenna. So antenna can look like this. Sometimes people draw antennas like that. But 
That's what a an, uh, wireless antenna looks like. So let's say I have an array of antennas. And they're all connected to the transmitter. So let's get rid of that. My transmitter. And then you have an array of antennas at the receiver, which I'll draw in a second. How does MIMO work? So if anyone says, oh yeah, I'm doing research on MIMO, now you can say, oh yeah? So how many, how many antennas are in your MIMO system? <gasps> He knows something about MIMO. Okay, so, so just to intimidate that grad student, right? Or ask them how their thesis is coming along. <laughs> no, that's a bad one. Don't do that. <laughs> Seriously, like, I ha like, again, sometimes I don't have a filter on me. So sometimes I see a PhD student and I say, oh, oh, great. So how are you doing? So when are you defending your dissertation? That's always a very sensitive question. It's like, oh, well, you know, once I get this last result, you know, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> or how long have you been in your PhD for? So nev never good questions. So, <laughs> so what happens is the way MIMO works is that th these antennas, this guy here, let's say antenna one, transmits one, like, one set of information. Antenna two transmits a different set of information. Antenna three sends a different batch of information. Same thing with antenna four. What antenna one will do is it'll say, I'm going to send to this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, that information. Antenna 2 is going to broadcast to these four antennas the same thing. But, uh, but I mean, different information, but the same sort of all four. And then they all do this. They all send different information. So let's say each antenna sends 54 megabits per second. And so each, if you have four now antennas sending totally different information on each antenna, you have four times. 54 megabits per second of information flowing out of this single transmitter. And then the receiver uses some fancy smancy signal processing. Okay? So it does array signal processing. And what it does, it's kind of interesting. These antennas usually are spaced between 5 to 10 wavelengths apart. And that's very important. The physics here is really, really important. So a wavelength, we remember what wavelengths are, right? So lambda is equal to the speed of light over f, correct? Right? So what happens is if you're doing Wi-Fi frequencies, what's a single wavelength approximately? 30 centimeters, I think, right? So what it, okay. This is now, uh, so what's frequency? 2.4 gigahertz. So 2.4 gigahertz, so 10 to the 9. And speed of light is what? Uh, so times 10 to the 8. So what is this approximately? 0.125. And that's going to be meters, right? So that, so what it is is 12.5 centimeters, so it's about this much, that is a single wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz. Is, is that correct, Andrew? Just double checking. A year and a half. <laughs> okay. So what happens is you have 12.5 centimeters. To make sure that the antennas, they have to be far enough apart. Because what happens is if your antennas are too close, the signal processing does not work. So you need 5 to 10 times 12.5 centimeters. So we're talking about a couple of feet, no, three to four feet apart for each antenna in order for MIMO to work, right? So you have five to 10, uh, five to 10, so five times 12.5 centimeters here, five times 12.5 centimeters here, and five times 12.5 centimeters here. So that would be about 60 centimeters, so that's a little bit over a half a meter, so about half a yard, right? That's how far your antennas are supposed to be spaced out. And what that does is, why do we do that? So I'm going to mention a probability word, but you're not responsible to remember it. But it's so easy, but you're not responsible. They have to be uncorrelated. When you have something that's five wavelengths apart, the, the wireless signal that this antenna gets relative to this antenna are like, they, they don't influence each other. They're so far apart. It's almost like the weather here 
and the weather in Boston, somewhat uncorrelated. The weather here and the weather in Montreal, totally uncorrelated. I think it's snowing today in Montreal. I should call mom and dad. So what happens is, in an electromagnetic sense, the antennas, if they're 5 to 10 lambda apart, what ends up happening is they experience the wireless energy differently. And then what happens is your signal processing in your receiver can separate out each of these 54 megabits per second signals from antenna 1, 2, 3, 4. That is MIMO. That's what you're seeing right now in like 802.11n, what you're going to see in 802.11af, and what you're also seeing in 4G and 5G. So this is really that the future, if you will. MIMO, like, well, MIMO was a buzzword a few years ago. Now it's distributed MIMO. But this idea of sending multiple information sources all at the same time in your receiver is smart. Hey, no problem, huh? No. OK, so that's MIMO. So that's a big aside. But that's a very big aside, because what ends up happening is this is what we're seeing now in 802.11. OK. So what's special about the logical architecture of 802.11? CSMACA, yes. Matthew. What about the MIMO connection? Yes. Oh, I shouldn't have deleted it. If my computer's using MIMO, the antennas have to be so far apart. If not, my computer can't communicate with the receiver. So what happens is, like, well, for a small, small guy, what they might do, um, well, unfortunately, yeah, that you're, it's going to be a little bit on the extreme side. So what, what might happen is they might also combine antennas that are, sh like they have a different radi radiation pattern that might be directional. But barring that, usually MIMO on a small laptop is, or a cell phone is really, really difficult. So they have another technology out there called MISO. <laughs> I know, there's all these weird names. So multiple input. No, multiple input, single output. So what happens is you might have multiple antennas, and then your laptop picks up the sync, like you know, both of them at the same time and tries to uncorrelate them, right? And then your laptop might send out a single signal, and then you have two antennas at the access point to pick it up and se separate the two out. We call that SIMO. So single input, multiple output, I know. And then there's SISO. But then, you know, go to the computer architecture folks and they have FIFO, right? First in, first out, and blah, blah, blah. Or Philo. And anyways, yes, so that's a great point. MIMO, of course, is actually used in things where you have a much bigger sort of structure. So like automobiles and stuff, if you have an array. Or airplanes, right? So I'm always like, cool, I always look out of the window and I look at the wings. I'm trying to find like the avionics. And they always have multiple antennas on the wings. I'm saying, is it FIMO? Or is it not? But that's a great point. That's a great point. All right. Blah. So CSMA CA, we'll be talking about that next week. It's almost like CSMA CD in the sense that it tries to avoid collisions as opposed to Aloha and Slot Aloha. We also have different types of authentication. You probably, when you set up wireless LANs at home, you probably chose like WPA2 and maybe uh, some other sort of uh, encryption to protect your information, right? Because what's the bad thing about wireless? When you're transmitting, everybody else hears you, right? Seriously, like, you know, like, uh, I, I'm always, like, you know, when I moved into my neighborhood, I think I was the only Wi-Fi access point, and just like the other night, it's like, again, who's Red House 34? It's like, oh, could it be my neighbors at 34 Malden Street? No, no just kidding. Um, then I mentioned about the physical layer. FHSS, we don't use too much, or DSSS, we really use OFDM. And I mentioned the multiple standards. So uh, again, this is kind of rehashing what we talked about before. Okay. And then 802.11a, unfortunately, didn't do so great. But one thing, you, you like, you know, again, let's say we revisit OFDM. So notice here that th they say subcarrier spacing is what? 31.25 megahertz, what does that mean? So going back to, uh, the, the, you know, the, to the whiteboard, let's draw it out. What is OFDM? And what do they mean by 0 0.3125 megahertz? What happens is the following. So what OFDM does, so let's say we look at the frequency domain. 
so frequency. So what happens is, suppose this is a single transmission, right? This is a single transmission. The way OFDM works in 802.11a is that we have 48 simultaneous narrow band, so very slow transmissions, all transmitting at the same time. Each one of these transmissions we call a subcarrier. So we have 48 subcarriers. And these subcarriers are separated by 0.3125 megahertz. Okay? And so the way the, so overall at the end of the day, we have 48 subcarriers, and this is about, let me think, it's around around 20 megahertz in bandwidth. And what's interesting, because this uses OFDM, right? OFDM. This is great for supporting high data rate transmissions. And so this is what appears in 802.11a and all subsequent standards. So 802.11g is a combination of this and direct sequence fed spectrum at 2.4 gigahertz. Okay? So that's just an aside in regards. There are a lot of asides today. I don't know why. Okay? So that's 802.11a. And then B, this is the more successful of the two, and it uses something called complementary code keying modulation. And what's so special about CCK? Why do we care about having CCK at 2.4 gigahertz? What is special about 2.4 gigahertz? I know a lot of questions. Let me give some answers. So what happens is the FCC says if you're going to operate in 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz, your signal needs to be spreaded. Your signal needs to be uh, through spread spectrum, it needs to be very low power over a wide bandwidth. So it can accommodate multiple devices. So as we'll see, what happens is CCC, CCK modulation has that characteristic. It's not called spread spectrum, but spread spectrum like. It has that characteristic. And what G does is it takes CCK modulation and then combines it with uh, OFDM so you get the high data rate and you achieve what the FCC is asking for. And so that's why 802.11g, you get things like up to 54 megabits per second in 2.4 gigahertz. It's the best of both worlds. Low frequency and high data rates. All right. So I know this is kind of like a fire hose of standards. Everybody loves standards. But, but really, what has this done? So this, I think, single-handedly, when the world was kind of like on the edge in terms of wireless technology, right, with cellular technology, I think the following 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, I th Wi-Fi was really what took off, right? Like, if you look now, if you go to your apartment buildings, if you go to res halls, um, if you install some app, like I have the, like that Wi-Fi analyzer on my phone, whatever, whatever app you have, you can probably see a gajillion Wi-Fi access points, right? So that's kind of that stopgap um, between, let's say, the sort of the hiccup in the cellular market and where we are with 4G right now. And I think in the future of 5G, you're going to kind of see the merger of the two. What you're going to see is you're going to not have like Wi-Fi by itself and you're going to have a cellular technology by itself. You're going to have the two combined together. So like, for instance, femtocells, where you have LTE in the home giving you cellular access and wireless access for your laptops and everything. Like, uh, how many of you, like, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, how many of you are uh, getting your um, laptops tethered to your phone? I'm just kind of curious. One, two, three. And you know, many years ago, about five years ago, if you got your uh, laptop tethered to your phone, um, what happened is that was a $20 per month additional charge, right? Now, like, are any of you guys paying for tethering? Not at all. Well, why? <laughs> Okay, okay. Exactly. The business model. It's like they want you to use data. That's, that's the thing. But the future, your access point at home will also be your cellular base station. It'll be basically your single source of information. All right? So with that, hopefully this was insightful. Um, and that concludes lecture 16. All right. So hopefully this provided some insights. Um, if you if you have